Dostoevsky is a titan of great literature, and The Brothers Karamazov is his masterpiece. It is a staggering novel that thoroughly and powerfully penetrates to the heart of the human condition. With The Brothers Karamazov, we are gifted one of the most sublime and rigorous explorations of theodicy in all of literature. Dostoevsky poses and compellingly explores the age-old question of if there truly is a benevolent god, then why do bad things happen to good people? Indeed, early on in the novel, Dmitri, one of the Karamazov brothers, talks of man being broad and the devil being locked in battle with God, and the battlefield is the human heart. Well, we could say that this book is the human heart, and that is the battle we are being dragged into when we read and reread this masterpiece. This is a book about suffering and meaning and God and faith. Faith versus reason. And in Ivan Karamazov's famous, iconic prose poem, The Grand Inquisitor, we are forced to confront the problem of free will. Because being free agents and having volition is a burden. And what kind of loving, benevolent God would give us the burden of free will? The Brothers Karamazov is Dostoevsky's final novel, and it is essentially incomplete because it was supposed to be part one of a greater work, and part two was supposed to largely follow Alyosha, the spiritual Karamazov brother. But we unfortunately do not have that second volume because Dostoevsky died not too long after the publication of this work. The Brothers Karamazov was first published serially in The Russian Messenger from 1879 to 1880. And in the years since its first publication, this work has gone on to be the favourite work of literature of many of the most influential thinkers in history. Indeed, Sigmund Freud said that The Brothers Karamazov of was the most magnificent novel ever written. Freud wrote of the rich personality of Dostoevsky and the bewildering complexity of his personality, and he saw four facets in Dostoevsky's personality. They were the creative artist, the neurotic, the moralist, and the sinner. Dostoevsky's place, Freud wrote, is not far behind Shakespeare. The Brothers Karamazov is the most magnificent novel ever written. The episode of the Grand Inquisitor, one of the peaks in the literature of the world, can hardly be valued too highly. In addition to Freud, other famous thinkers and writers who revered the brothers Karamazov include Albert Einstein, Virginia Woolf, Haruki Murakami, Cormac McCarthy, Kurt Vonnegut, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who actually knew whole passages of the novel by heart, and the novel was one of the few things he took to the front when he served in World War I. This work was also one of James Joyce's favourites, and Joyce said that this work made a deep impression on him. William Faulkner reread The Brothers Karamazov endlessly and placed it beside the Bible and the works of William Shakespeare as one of the greatest influences on him. And so, to kick off our guided reading and lecture series of this masterpiece at the Hardcore Literature Book Club at patreon.com forward slash hardcore literature, let's talk about how to read this masterpiece and how to bring ourselves fully to Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. So, my first tip for engaging with the Brothers Karamazov in a meaningful way is to treat it like a philosophical dialogue, because it most certainly is. And make sure that you are utilising marginalia, annotations, and journaling, writing upon all of the themes that Dostoevsky prompts you to explore throughout your reading experience. One question that you might find useful to pose in order to orient your reading experience, one question you might want to pose is which one of the brothers you most identify with throughout. Indeed, we might find that we identify with different elements 
of the Karamazov brothers. Because one of the most marvellous things about Dostoevsky's characterization is, yes, he has an incredible psychological understanding, and these characters really are psychologically robust, but at the same time, many of his characters are rather allegorical, and they're rather symbolic. They are frequently stand-ins for different strains of philosophical thought or world view. They are personifications of different facets of the human condition. Indeed, Colin Wilson, in his highly influential work The Outsider, tells us that the Karamazov brothers, taken together, present a great synthesis of body, intellect, and emotions. That's Mitya, or Dmitri, Ivan, and Alyosha, or Alexei. Dmitri is the body, the flesh, Ivan is the intellect, and whilst Colin Wilson says that Alyosha is the emotions, I would say that Alyosha is the spirit. That's another way of saying he's the spirit. Then, of course, we have Smerdyakov, who I would be surprised if anyone identified with. We also have the father, the Karamazov father, the patriarch, Fyodor Pavlovich, and Dostoevsky, who gave this patriarch, this father, his own name, said that we are all Fyodor Pavlovich is. And Fyodor Pavlovich is an incredibly vitalistic character. He's very amusing and entertaining, but he's also incredibly reprehensible. And we might wonder how much of ourselves do we see in the father of the Karamazov brothers, whilst we're also wondering which one of the brothers we most identify with, we most feel in simpatico with. Now, of course, it would be difficult to reduce this book down to any one personage. We must take it as a whole. And Keep in mind the fact that Dostoevsky composed in voices. That's how Richard Pevere puts it brilliantly in his introduction to the P and V, the Pevere and Volokonsky translation. Dostoevsky composed in voices, and Mikhail Bakhtin would write of Dostoevsky's polyphonics. He would say that works like the Brothers Karamazov are polyphonic works. And to me, that is very much what it feels like to read Dostoevsky's novel. It feels like lots of competing voices, lots of emerging voices. It feels like a cacophony, like a great din is being made, and these voices are competing for supremacy, and each of the voices are marvellously distinct and unique. Bakhtin writes that Dostoevsky could hear dialogic relationships everywhere, in all manifestations of conscious and intelligent human life, where consciousness began, their dialogue began also. And so how very fitting that we should enter into a dialogue with the great writer. That means we should be writing in the margins and we should be discussing Dostoevsky's concerns with him across time. We should go out into nature and treat Dostoevsky as our walking companion and run through everything he wants us to think about in our minds, engage in conversation with Dostoevsky. Bakhtin also wrote of Dostoevsky's characters as having unfinalizability, which is certainly quite a mouthful to say, and that means that they cannot be defined by externalities. Indeed, we might think that some of Dostoevsky's characters, as Hegel said of Shakespeare's characters, we might think that they are free artists of themselves. Bakhtin wrote that the genuine life of the personality is made available only through a dialogic penetration of that personality, during which it freely and reciprocally reveals itself. And how marvellous of Dostoevsky to take a fractured family in order to explore the themes of free will, morality, and God. The Brothers Karamazov, among many other things, is a novel about fathers and sons. And Dostoevsky, in his writer's diary, would say that the novel was taking shape inside him for many years. But we might see that the spark that really modulated this story and really gave life to it was a painful one, because Dostoevsky lost his son. His son, Alyosha. Alyosha was just three years old. He died in 1878 of epilepsy. He had an epileptic fit and he died, and epilepsy was the family condition. He inherited it from his father, Dostoevsky. And so there is a great river of pain running through this book, and we wouldn't have it in the form that we have it today, at the very least, had Alyosha not tragically died. And we might think that this is very frequently the case with great works of literature, 
indeed the greatest works of literature are often sparked, often brought into life off the back of a family member's tragic death. I think instinctively of Shakespeare and how he lost his son Hamnet when he was just 11 years old and that gave life to Hamlet, another staggering, astonishing work. Dostoevsky tragically lost his son and was so understandably mired in grief that his wife had to take him to one of Russia's most famous monasteries in which he would encounter the elder who would inspire the Zosima protagonist in The Brothers Karamazov. He named the hero of his book Alyosha, although arguments are frequently made as to who really is the hero of this work, he named at the very least the most idealistic character after his son. He named the character who was the embodiment of everything that he would have liked to have been after his son. And indeed what a shame that Dostoevsky himself would die and leave us without the second part of this book in which we would follow Alyosha, we would follow his life and we would see him develop into a new kind of revolutionary. So this is a book about fathers and sons and in Dostoevsky's Diary of a Writer he thought that Russia's social dilemma was one of fathers and sons and indeed isn't that always the case? We could extrapolate that out and we might wonder how much of our society today, regardless of what country or what time we find ourselves in, wouldn't society be improved if we could improve father-son relationships across society? Think about what the positive knock-on effect would be if we could reduce the amount of broken homes that comprise our society. And so Dostoevsky had a great number of social concerns and one of them was his belief that fathers had a duty to the nation, to society, to improve society on the level of the family. And we might think that that's a very fair ambition. We can make a difference, we can make a societal difference by first working close to home and focusing on ourselves, our relationships, our families. And so in The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky gave us a picture of family dissolution in Russia in the hopes of instigating change. In the later half of the 19th century we can see that those with orthodox beliefs in Russia thought it to be a real problem that society was becoming increasingly tolerant of any breaks away from the traditional patriarchal family structure. Society was becoming tolerant and even praising and pedestalling things like infidelity. And so Dostoevsky would write, you are the fathers, they are your children, you are contemporary Russia, they are the future Russia. And indeed at the heart of this novel, and this isn't a spoiler, this is the crux of the novel, this is what the philosophical and spiritual debates all hinge around, at the heart of the novel is a parasite, the murder of a father. That's Fyodor Pavlovich. And Freud would write that it can scarcely be owing to chance that three of the masterpieces of the literature of all time, the Oedipus Rex of Sophocles, Shakespeare's Hamlet and Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, should all deal with the same subject, parasite. And in all three, moreover, the motive for the deed, sexual rivalry for a woman, is laid bare. At the heart of a novel about a fractured family, a parasite, son-killing father, we feel a deep yearning for unity. It's no mistake that when the Karamazov brothers are taken together, there is a unity there. And in that sense of unity, we also get a sense of culpability. And one of the central themes of this work is best expressed by Khalil Gibran who told us that the murdered is not unaccountable for his own murder. What does that mean? Well that means we can't very well talk about free will without talking about guilt, blame and culpability. And ultimate volition means taking responsibility not only for our own actions but taking responsibility for the sins of the world. Can we be guilty of a crime we didn't commit? Well what comment is Dostoevsky trying to make when he tells us throughout, this is one of the refrains throughout the Brothers Karamazov, that all Karamazov 
brothers are alike. And it doesn't matter whether they are a sensualist, like Dimitri, and like his father. It doesn't matter if they are an intellectual, like Ivan. It doesn't matter if they're spiritual, like Alyosha. They're all the same. And if the family unit is a microcosm for society at large, and what we do on the family level matters, then are we not all brothers, and are we not all ultimately culpable for one another's actions, not only our own. Now it's important to keep in mind that this book was born out of a really turbulent time in Russia. The Brothers Karamazov is set in the 1860s post-abolition of serfdom. Up until 1861, the foundation of Russian society was built on serfdom, the peasant class. And serfs were essentially slaves. They had to work the land of a landlord. And when Alexander II emancipated the serfs, he did not erase the inequality overnight. That didn't solve the problem. And indeed we wonder why so many of the greatest novels, the novels that really thoroughly explore the human condition, why are they Russian? Why are they 19th century Russian works of literature? Well during the 19th century Russia was going through a really painful forging of identity. We most certainly see that comment in works like War and Peace by Tolstoy. And a nation experiencing suffering and hardship and identity identity crisis is fertile soil for great art, and so the golden age of Russian literature is born. It's born out of pain and suffering in much the same way that the Brothers Karamazov was born out of Dostoevsky's individual pain and suffering, his own search for meaning, the loss of his son. At this time there was a bit of a butting of heads when it came to Western European influence. Russia was experiencing an influx of liberal thought and different Western philosophies, and so there was this tension between are we European, are we Western, or are we Russian? And if we are Russian, then what does that mean? What is the Russian soul? How do we define that? And so we see these intellectual movements spring up across Russia. We see these radical political movements, ones that would lead to, in the same year of Dostoevsky's death, the assassination of the last great Tsar, Alexander II, the emancipator of the serfs. And so we see this progressive European intellectualism pitted against Russian orthodoxy. And and Christian conservative thought. And in Dostoevsky's great novel, we see these strains personified. We see Ivan is a personification of reason and intellectualism, doubt and atheism, whilst protagonists like Alyosha and Zosima are personifications of the more Slavic, orthodox religious thought. And indeed, Dostoevsky losing his son Alyosha was most certainly not the only hardship he had to face over the course of his life. In the 1850s, he was sentenced to hard labour in Siberia for being part of the revolutionary Petrashevsky circle. And he was accused of reading and circulating the works of Belinsky, who was a notorious critic of the government, circulating his banned letter to Gogol. And so Dostoevsky was bound hand and foot, and he was dragged in front of the firing squad for a terrifying mock execution. He was made to believe that he was going to die, that he was going to be executed. Now, as a little side note, one way to really get a lot more out of Dostoevsky is to know something of his life, and I highly recommend a tremendous biography from Joseph Frank, called Dostoevsky a writer in his time. That's a good place to get started. And at the Hardcore Literature Book Club, over the course of our guided reading, I will be providing some optional reading assignments for the relevant pages in this biography, along with Bible reading assignments, documentary recommendations, and questions to facilitate deep discussion. Now let's spend a moment talking about Ivan Karamazov, and specifically the Grand Inquisitor, which even if you haven't read The Brothers Karamazov, you most likely recognise that title. You know something of this prose poem, this little interpolated story. This is Ivan Karamazov's exploration of the problem of cruelty and suffering in the world. Ivan who posits the idea that if there is no God and there is no immortality, then everything is permitted. Ivan, who is personification of reason and intellect, explores the problem at the heart 
of the book of Job, which is one of the biblical books that I would highly recommend you layer alongside your reading of this novel in order to get all the more out of it. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why must we suffer? Indeed, why must innocent children suffer? For no reason. What is the reason for our pain, our suffering, our misery? And in the fifth book of the Brothers Karamazov, in a chapter called Pro and Contra, we get the story of the Grand Inquisitor, which is somewhat ironically presented to us in the vein of a parable. And indeed, in order to learn to read parable, I highly recommend you go to the New Testament. I highly recommend a short story by Tolstoy, called How Much Land Does a Man Need? We recently had an episode of the Hardcore Literature podcast exploring that story and discussing how to read parable. And we spoke about the Russian oral tradition, so it's well worth checking out if you haven't already. Parable and allegory and metaphor presents an interesting problem. On the one hand, encoding our messages in striking imagery ensures that they endure and wisdom is passed down through the ages. We remember the story of, say, Jonah and the whale because we have that striking image of Jonah being swallowed up by a great fish and then vomited back out. Would we remember the message of that story, that allegory, if it had been given to us rather literally? If we had been simply told that Jonah defied God, turned away from God, and needed to learn to return to the way of God. We wouldn't remember that, it's not striking. The problem, however, with parable is that it is either misinterpreted or the meaning just completely eludes us. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus giving his disciples parables and he needs to essentially teach them how to interpret, how to decipher the parables. He says, this represents this and this represents this. And he says, now you know how to interpret, we're going to speak in parable. But of course, Aristotle would tell us that thinking in metaphor is the highest form of cognition. So who can really blame us when we struggle to assimilate and comprehend the metaphorical, the symbolic, the allegorical? So let's talk about the Grand Inquisitor. And of course, we're going to go a lot more in depth when we get to this passage in the Hardcore Literature Book Club lecture series. But we can most certainly enjoy this work in isolation and start thinking about it in preparation for breaching the work, going into the work. Ivan and Alyosha, the Karamazov brother who is an embodiment of reason and the Karamazov brother who is the embodiment of spirituality are talking. And Ivan has this story that explores the burden of free will because nothing has been more insufferable for man than freedom. The story goes like this. Christ comes back in 16th century Spain and he ends up incarcerated because the work of Christ is at odds with the work of the church. Referring to a famous passage in the New Testament Gospel of Luke where Jesus is tested by Satan in the wilderness, the Grand Inquisitor basically says that Christ's rejection of the three temptations of the devil, the three temptations of Satan, guaranteed free will for mankind, and that was not a good thing. The assertion is this, Christ should not have given humanity the burden of free will. We shouldn't have the power of choice. We shouldn't have volition, but rather Christ should have gifted us security and happiness instead. And we should have had free will removed from us. Why? Well, essentially, it's too difficult to exercise free will, to be moral, to be good, and to choose to love. That is far too difficult. And hardly anybody has the strength to be faithful and to exercise their free will in the service of good. And what does that mean? That means that the overwhelming majority of mankind are damned, damned to hell. What kind of loving, benevolent God gives us free will knowing that we will fall short and therefore damning us. And so the church is now embarking upon the goal of correcting Christ's error. And the church are attempting to relieve humanity of the burden of free will. Now let's talk about that Bible story, the three temptations of Christ. Christ goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and Satan appears and tempts him. The first temptation of Christ is the temptation of hunger, the temptation of bread. Satan says, essentially, if you are the son of God, turn that stone to bread. 
and sate your hunger. And Christ rejects that temptation. And he said very famously that man should not live on bread alone but on the word of God. The second temptation of Christ in the wilderness was the temptation of performing a miracle. Satan essentially says, well, you can throw yourself off this great height, and if you really are the son of God, then you will be saved. Angels will save you from dying. But not only that, men need miracles in order to believe. So you need to give them a miracle, or how on earth can you ask them to believe in you. And Christ rejects that temptation. And the third temptation of Christ is the temptation of power. Satan says to Christ, I can give you dominion. I can give you power over all the kingdoms all over the world. I can give you complete and ultimate control. And once again, Christ refuses. And so the church decides to take up that power in his name. And so according to the Grand Inquisitor, Satan was right, not Christ. And ever since the church took over the Roman Empire, it has been performing the work of Satan, not Christ. And not out of evil, but rather the opposite. The church has been performing the work of Satan in service of good, in service of saving mankind and seeking the best for mankind. And that basically means giving humanity security and happiness over free will. We're going to take that burden away from you. We're going to take that free will away from you. And of course, people want authority and they want miracles. But that's not really the point of faith. Do a miracle and I'll believe in you. No, the faith or the belief should be there without such things. It shouldn't be contingent upon miracles. If one requires a miracle, then one does not have faith. And what we get with Ivan's Grand Inquisitor story is a really powerful argument against the Christian faith. Why should we worship a God who permits us to suffer so? And how is it fair that we must worship a God who so vastly overestimates what the vast majority of people can do? Here you go. Here's some free will. Be good even in the face of great suffering and believe even in the absence of miracles, even without proof, or else you will burn in hell. What have you done there? Well, you've basically just damned all of humanity. The problem with all of this, which you may have already intuited, is that this is a problem of over intellectualizing. This is a problem that cannot be solved on the level of intellectual thought, reasoning, consciousness. But the elder figure, the figure of aspiration to Alyosha in the Brothers Karamazov, Zosima, teaches us that we can perceive the mystery and we can experience divinity through love. Not the intellectual abstract love of humanity that an atheist might have, but through an active love in which we take moral responsibility for everything. And Dostoevsky, through Ivan telling the Grand Inquisitor story, offers one of the most compelling arguments for atheism in all of literature, and indeed that really, that really posed a problem to Dostoevsky. He was concerned, because of course he was incredibly orthodox Christian, he was incredibly religious and spiritual, he was concerned that his argument for the other side, in effect, was too powerful. He was concerned he made a much more compelling argument for atheism than faith. But I think that's kind of the point, because when the Grand Inquisitor finishes their compelling argument, how does Christ respond to this argument? Christ responds simply, not with words, but through an action, through a loving action. Christ silently and lovingly kisses the Grand Inquisitor on the lips. And the Grand Inquisitor sets Christ free and tells him not to return. And Ivan finishes this story, and how does Alyosha respond? He responds by simply kissing his brother on the lips. He kisses him like Christ did in his story. And yes, Dostoevsky presents a powerful argument for atheism, but I think the point is that faith, true faith, can handle it. Faith can handle and overcome and resist the strongest argument, and we refute that argument not on the level of conscious thought or reasoning, 
but through something as simple as a kiss. Faith is not about logical argument. Faith is a power beyond words. And that's the overriding power of love and forgiveness. And it's perfectly encapsulated in Alyosha's kiss and the kiss of Christ. And this is an idea that we've come up against before. One might think of Keats's negative capability. He gave the crown for negative capability to Shakespeare. Now, negative capability is the ability to sit with mystery and uncertainty without any clutching after fact or reason. Mystery is kind of the point. God is in the stillness, in the silence, and we're not supposed to know everything. We can't reason ourselves into belief. If we can still our thoughts and be present in the present moment, and if we can compel ourselves to love, then that is knowing God. And it's a knowledge beyond thought, and it's a knowledge beyond words. Love can be a form of knowledge. Indeed, we might call it the ultimate form of knowledge. And this is not an intellectual knowledge. Think about what damned us. Think back to the book of Genesis and the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. It was the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't good and evil itself, it was the knowledge of it, the awareness of it. Divinity, heaven, bliss, God, whatever term we might use. All of this is beyond the binaries, beyond good and evil. And indeed, The Brothers Karamazov is a book about words and is a book about the word, the word of God and the word made flesh. And indeed, we might find ourselves sympathising with Hamlet, who, when he's asked what he's reading, simply mutters, words, words, words. Words are imperfect, and all great artists know that. Great writers push words to breaking point, and we know they do this because they very often try to take on the condition of other art forms, be it painting, the condition of the visual arts, like Joseph Conrad, who above all wanted to make us see, or the condition of music. Walter Pater told us that all art constantly aspires to the condition of music, and James Joyce tried to take words to the condition of music. Nietzsche told us that which we can find words for is something already long dead in our hearts, and Hermann Hesse, in his brilliant Siddhartha, Hesse reminds us that a wise man sounds mad or foolish when he uses words, and that is why doctrines fall down. Give me a creed, give me a doctrine, give me words to live by, but words do not adequately communicate religious or spiritual truth. Now, what does communicate that? A simple kiss. Now, all of this leads me on to my next point, which is, in addition to treating the Brothers Karamazov as a philosophical dialogue, I advise you to treat it as a spiritual vision too, because it absolutely is. And I highly recommend you supplement your reading with scripture. Use this book as an opportunity to deepen your appreciation and understanding of the Bible, and this is something that will pay off dividends. This is a very good thing to do, whether one has faith or not, whether one is a believer or not, whether one takes the Bible as the word of God, or whether one has another religion, indeed, whether one has no religion, no faith, regardless of your personal opinion, your experience, your own relationship or lack of when it comes to the Bible, this is hands down the best way you can immediately make your appreciation of great literature in the Western canon all the more rich and robust. The number one most powerful thing you can do is to have an understanding of the Bible, and the second most powerful thing you can do is to have an understanding of Shakespeare. And indeed, there are heavy heapings of both in Dostoevsky. There's the Bible and there's Shakespeare. Now, I will be making specific recommendations for a Bible reading program at the Hardcore Literature Book Club, one that I think will be personally beneficial for anyone seeking to undertake such a rewarding enterprise. Now, Dostoevsky knew the Gospels intimately from a very young age. And indeed, one of the things that makes 
great literature all the more difficult for modern readers is that we don't have the same implicit understanding, we cannot take an understanding of the Bible for granted in much the same way we cannot take an understanding of Shakespeare for granted. Dostoevsky knew the Gospels intimately and he learned them by heart. He particularly would have known the stories of the fall in the Garden of Eden and the book of Job and stories like the raising of Lazarus very very well. The New Testament provided a great comfort to him when he was imprisoned as a copy of the New Testament was the only reading material available to him and indeed today we still have his copy. It has survived and we can see his fingernail impressions and his annotations in the margins. And so Dostoevsky read and reread the New Testament relentlessly. And so his work is layered with allusions. Now, when we talk about allusions in literature, there are two kinds of allusions. There is the in-house allusion in which a writer is referring to things that have already happened in the book or they are foreshadowing things to come. And then there is the kind of allusion that is a reference to the wider literary tradition. We talk about Shakespearean allusions, Miltonic allusions, and of course, biblical allusions. Great literature is many things. It's profound, it's visionary, it's metaphorical, and it is also allusive and therefore frequently elusive. The more elusive a work is, the more dense it is, the more difficult it is. Difficult because the implicit knowledge that one needs increases and one's appreciation, enjoyment and understanding of the work is in proportion to the wider reading they have already done in the tradition. As I've said, we can get the biggest win when it comes to understanding literature in the Western canon from reading the Bible. If we do a Pareto analysis, 80-20 rule, you know, the idea that 20% of our actions will give us 80% of our rewards, then we want to immerse ourselves in the Bible and we want to immerse ourselves in Shakespeare. And indeed, if you're interested in doing a deep reading of Shakespeare, which will really pay off when it comes to Dostoevsky, then I highly recommend you take part in the Shakespeare Project at the Hardcore Literature Book Club, where we are reading the entire works of Shakespeare over the course of the year. And this has honestly been the most enjoyable part of my year so far. We have a wonderful group. The discussion is vibrant and nuanced and varied and exciting. But returning to the Bible, I would personally recommend the King James version of the Bible. Shakespeare himself would have been working from the Geneva Bible and the Geneva Bible led to the King James version. But this is just brilliant literature in and of itself. Yes, many of us read the Bible for the spiritual nourishment and wisdom it gifts us. Many of us will read the Bible as the word of God, but it's also powerful, sublime literature in its own right too. And the King James Version is the most poetic, in my opinion. So I highly recommend you get a copy of that. And I also recommend a book called The Literary Guide to the Bible, edited by Robert Alter and Frank Commode. And again, keeping with the 80-20 rule, I would like to recommend to you a couple of starter books from the Bible that will really pay off when it comes to understanding Dostoevsky. First, I would highly recommend The Gospels of John, which begins in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I recommend the Gospel of John. I also recommend the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, and particularly you might find it rewarding to start with Luke 4, 1 to 13. That's Jesus tested in the wilderness. In addition to the Gospels of Luke and John, I highly recommend the Book of Job. Now that's a really lengthy one. It's also one of the most profound and poetic works of wisdom literature that I've personally ever encountered. That's a really powerful one. And again, we have a podcast on the Book of Job, which you can check out by searching for the Hardcore Literature Podcast on Spotify and iTunes. So, Book of Job, Gospel of John, Gospel of Luke, also the Book of Genesis. I highly recommend you get comfortable with the Book of Genesis. Malcolm Jones, in a great essay called Dostoevsky and Religion, reminds us that Dostoevsky most certainly was a Christian novelist, and some readers may regard this as an obvious truth, whilst other readers might regard this assertion as dismissing everything that is of enduring importance in Dostoevsky's work. But regardless, in Dostoevsky's work and in his life, he was in a pitched battle with the most desolate atheism. He was obsessed with the unresolved and irresolvable conflicts of the spirit, which he called the accursed questions. Now, of course, personally, I don't think questioning one's faith 
is incompatible with a belief in God. In fact, I think at a certain point in our lives, we're all going to be put to the test. And if we find ourselves going through hardship and we look up at the night sky and we feel a sense of absence and we wonder, is that absence really pointing to a presence, a presence that we cannot intellectually comprehend? If we find ourselves in a moment of weakness wondering, well, is there a God? And if there isn't, then what? I don't think those questions are incompatible with belief and ultimately can make us more resolved in our belief, in our faith, it can make us stronger. And so when Dostoevsky was concerned that he had presented too compelling a case for atheism, part of me thinks, good, make the argument for atheism as strong as possible. Make it very, very, very strong and then dismantle it in a kiss. Malcolm Jones writes that Dostoevsky presents the case for atheism so persuasively and so variously that many readers have been forced to conclude that this is what, in his heart, he really believed. I really do think that the fact that Dostoevsky could present the case for atheism so compellingly is testament to his strength of faith. God can stand up to the strongest refutation, the strongest argument. Jones goes on to tell us that what one observes in Dostoevsky's novels is a reflection of the process of discovery or rediscovery of the Christian tradition. In the face of its most deadly, one might say mutinous opponents, it is a process of rethinking Christianity in dialogue. Remember Dostoevsky composed in voices, a process which reached no final conclusion in his novels, whatever may have been the case with his own spiritual pilgrimage. Now, another tip when it comes to the Brothers Karamazov is to see the novel as an imperative to divinely love. Because recalling the wisdom of Saint John, which resonated with Tolstoy as well as Dostoevsky, to love is to know God. So love is a form of knowledge and it's a form of divine knowledge. And indeed there's this idea that the image of hell is the suffering of not being able to love. Now Dostoevsky thought that to love another according to Christ's commandment, loving one's neighbour as oneself, loving one's enemies, Dostoevsky thought that that was impossible. Now Christ might have been able to do this and in the figure of Christ we then have a great ideal, a personification of a great ideal towards which we can strive. Christ is word made flesh. And indeed we might think of Robert Browning's Andrea del Sarto. Ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? We might think of Oscar Wilde who said that a map that does not feature utopia is not even worth glancing at. We should always have something that is just out ahead of us, just beyond our reach. Dostoevsky thought that to fully and divinely love as Christ commanded was beyond us and our egos hold us back. He also believed that because Christ is a personification of the word of God, word made flesh, word in human form, he believed that if we have faith, that the word has become flesh, that's what will save the world. And now shifting on from the philosophical to the practical, my next tip is to make sure that you choose the right translation of the Brothers Karamazov. Now I've said before, I'm not a purist when it comes to translations. I personally think that whatever translation gets you into the work is the right one for you. And indeed at the Hardcore Literature Book Club, we did a taste test of a really great scene, a really great passage in this novel. We did a taste test with five of the most popular translations of the Brothers Karamazov. The one that I will personally be working from and referencing for our guided reading is the PNV, the Pavir and Volokonsky, which you can see behind me, available in vintage paperback. The PNV has a very strong reputation for being the one that best captures Dostoevsky's voice in English. Not an easy thing to do. Dostoevsky is one of the most difficult Russian writers to translate, and many have tried valiantly, but if you stack different translations up against each 
other, you'll see that there can be quite a disparity in how different translators choose to give us the story. I personally don't mind Constance Garnett's translations of Russian literature, though as many have said, she doesn't sound like the writers in question, she always sounds like Constance Garnett. Whether she's translating Tolstoy or Chekhov or Turgenev or Dostoevsky, but her translations are very easy to read. I think that the Ignat Avesi, which is available in Oxford World's Classics, sounds rather poetic. I'm personally a little bit on the fence when it comes to the David Macduff translation in Penguin Paperback, and I downright don't like the David Magarshak translation, which used to be the Penguin Classics translation of choice before the David Macduff. If you want the translation decision to be made for you, then I highly recommend the Pavir and Volokonsky. Now, continuing to talk practicalities, after you have procured your translation, the next thing that you want to do for a big book, a difficult book, an intimidating book, is to break it down into manageable chunks and give yourself some predefined milestones to hit. So pace out your reading, and you can do this by following along at the Hardcore Literature Book Club, where we will be breaking this masterpiece down and discussing two books per lecture. There are 12 books in the Brothers Karamazov. And I think a really reasonable reading pace with this work, although I encourage you to embrace your own self-pace, is to aim for reading two books at a pace of a little over a week. That's less than a hundred pages, and I personally think that reading around ten pages a day is a really nice pace, because it gets you through the book at a fair trot, but it's also not so many pages that you're needing to inhale the work. It allows you to slow down, it allows you to underline, do marginalia, to journal, to think, to pause, to soak it all in. Ten pages a day is a very nice pace. It gives you a deep reading at a fairly swift pace. And indeed, for those following along with the Hardcore Literature Book Club lectures, our discussions will be coming out roughly over a week apart. So if that's a fair trot for you, you may wish to just focus on this big read, but if you can fit more reading into your schedule, you may wish to check out our back catalogue, because we have a lot of great reads there, from writers like Jane Austen and George Eliot, to James Joyce and Cormac McCarthy, and indeed we have some very exciting reading projects ongoing as well, like our Play of the Season series and our Shakespeare series. And that kind of blends into my next recommendation, which is to read The Brothers Karamazov with a community, with a group. These books are works that we engage with in solitude. Of course, solitary reading is one of the, the greatest pleasures afforded to us. But a book becomes more resonant, more profound, when we share it with another, when we talk it through when we think aloud or we think on paper, when we write our thoughts down, when we read what others have to say about the book. That's how we really powerfully live the great books. And one of the best communities for engaging with these great works of literature in a really meaningful way is the Hardcore Literature Book Club at patreon.com forward slash hardcore literature. And finally, I recommend that you really designate this book as meaningful and really bring yourself as fully as possible to it. When we're deep reading great literature, we're working. Yeah, we're self-scholars, we're working, and the kind of work that we want is the kind of work that Khalil Gibran spoke about. Work as love made visible. So we're working, we're playing, we're loving, we're living, we're thinking, we're writing, we're bringing our own lived experience and wisdom to these books, and we're taking the concerns of the characters on as our own. So befriend the characters, as Mortimer Adler would implore us to do. Meet them. Familiarise yourself with the world. Take your time. Work hard at developing a relationship with Dostoevsky. And remember that these books have things to tell us, and this deep, meaningful engagement with great literature is ultimately the highest form of self-talk. These books truly can make us better people if we bring ourselves fully to them. They improve our interpersonal relationships, they increase our empathy, they sharpen our reasoning powers, they improve the relationship we have with ourselves, our intrapersonal relationship. And the rewards with Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov are most certainly there, and they're directly in proportion to how much effort you put into the book. You will be rewarded, and I really believe that this book will make a very strong impression on you 
if you are open to it. And I would like to end today by saying thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you for watching and thank you for reading along. Let me know, what is your experience with Dostoevsky and the Brothers Karamazov? Have you read the Brothers Karamazov before or are you preparing for your first reading? If you're preparing for your first reading, what are you expecting? And what are you looking forward to? And indeed, if this is a rereading, then what would you like to get out of your reading this time around? What did you get out of it before? Thank you again for watching. I appreciate you and I hope you have a lovely day. Happy reading, everybody, and bye-bye for now.